All right, in this podcast, we're going to start talking about entropy. So first, just a little, what's the difference between thermodynamics and kinetics? Thermodynamics allows us to predict if a reaction can occur at all, if we give it enough time and the right conditions. Kinetics helps us predict if the reaction occurs at a reasonable rate. All right, so thermo, can it even occur? Kinetics, how fast is it going to occur? So what's going to drive a chemical and physical process? Well, two things. One is a decrease in enthalpy, and the other is an increase in entropy, okay? Or if you have both, that's even better. So a decrease in enthalpy is like an exothermic reaction. You have a release in energy, so the products are of lower energy than the reactants. And then entropy, well, you don't know what that is yet, but let's find out. It's basically a measure of the dispersal of matter and energy. It can be viewed as a measure of molecular randomness or disorder. In other words, chaos. It's defined in terms of probability. And basically, we're talking about the substances taking the arrangement that is most likely. And the most likely is always the most random. Okay, so basically, we're talking about how random, how chaotic it is. Now, we have entropy. Naturally, things are going to go from order to disorder or from lower to higher entropy. So if you want to think about this, think about your bedroom. Uh, naturally, if you are anything like the normal uh, teenage person, then your room is going to get messy. Because an order room, an ordered room requires that you put everything in its place. But there are just simply way more places in your room for you to put things not in the right place than in the right place. So here's an example, not my bedroom, but here you see order and here you see disorder. So your room probably looks more like the one on the right. So things naturally tend to progress towards disorder, okay? And my classroom is a great example of that. All right, so there's two ways that you can affect the entropy affect how the matter is dispersed or how the energy is dispersed. Matter dispersing can happen through phase changes, stoichiometric increases, volume changes at constant temperature, and dissolving. Energy dispersal um, occurs through temperature changes, changes in molecular complexity, or changes in the Coulombic interactions within an ionic solid. So let's start looking at all these a little more in depth. So how does the state of matter affect the entropy? Well, as you move from solid to liquid to gas to even plasma, the entropy increases. The molecules are moving further apart so their dispersal is greater. So the entropy of solids is much lower than the entropy of gases or plasma. Okay, so it increases going from solid to liquid to gas. All right, how does stoichiometry affect entropy? Well, first let's look at this reaction, okay? If you balanced it, you'd see you had one mole of reactant, and then over here it breaks into three separate things, and you get one, one, and then four, so a total of six moles of product, okay? This is a big increase in entropy, okay? Because you're going from one molecule to uh, six molecules, okay, which is more chaotic, okay? There's more ways for those six to be randomly dispersed than the one, okay? So stoichiometric is a big, big factor in increases in entropy. All right, now if you have, <clears throat> if you increase the volume at a constant temperature, so think about a syringe filled with air. If you were to pull back on the plunger, you would be increasing the volume of um, the container that that gas is occupying. And because you are increasing the volume, the gas will actually expand itself to fill that space. And when it does that, it's dispersing. So that's an increase in entropy. Now understand that volume, um, when you increase the volume, you're affecting something else as well at constant temperature. You're affecting the pressure. So when you increase the volume, you are decreasing the pressure. So a decrease in pressure at constant temperature also increases the entropy because it is allowing them to move further apart and collide less often. Dissolving. When you dissolve something, um, it's going to break into 
uh, well, depending on if it's ionic or covalent, depends on how it will react. So you know what? Let's just go look at a simulation to help us understand how dissolving affects the entropy. All right, so here's a great simulation. All right, so first we're going to start with something ionic, like sodium chloride, NaCl. So when I throw it in some water, okay, so smack us out some uh, salts there. All right, now you see what's happening is that the salt is actually breaking up. So the Na and the Cl are splitting back into the component ions, positive and negative, And then they are dispersing throughout the liquid. Now, if we go look at this at a little closer level by actually looking at the actual water molecules, and I'm going to go ahead and highlight their partial charges. Okay, now when we throw the salt molecules in there, again, we're expecting them to break into positives and negatives, and you see that the water molecules surround each of the ions, okay? So an ionic compound experiences a large increase in entropy when you dissolve it in water, okay? Because you're getting, first off, more parts because all the parts that made up the ionic compound are now breaking into positives and negatives, and they are moving further away from each other, which is dispersal, okay? Now let's go back and let's evaluate how a covalent um, substance would affect would be affected when we dropped it in water. So sugar, sucrose, um, so C12, H22O11, is another, is, a, is an example of a covalent compound. And in a covalent compound, you see that you're still getting dispersal, but instead of the um, compound breaking into component parts, you're not having a breaking of the compound at all. Okay, so it's not uh, component parting or breaking into positives and negatives like we saw with the um, ionic, the NaCl. Now you see the individual sugar molecules being dispersed, okay? Now if we look at this in a uh, in a closer view at the molecular level, okay? Now first I want to show you uh, sugar if it'll load up here. Here it goes. Okay, so that's a sugar molecule, okay? So you've got a bunch of carbons, those are the gray ones, and then the red ones are gonna be your oxygens and the white ones are your hydrogens, okay? So down here it's colored yellow just so we can see what's going on. We got two sugar molecules, we're gonna throw them in the water, and we see that they start to um, disperse as well. Now, like I said before, they're not dispersing near as well as the NaCl, but they do disperse. Now, if you think about it, you've got the uh, oxygens and hydrogens on the sugar molecule. Those are going to be able to hydrogen bond with that water. Okay, so that's going to be a very strong interaction. However, when you're thinking about covalent versus ionic, dissolving an ionic compound is going to provide you a lot bigger increase in entropy than solving a covalent compound, just because of the fact that the ionic will break into component ions and the covalent won't. So ionic is going to have a larger dispersal, so more randomness, <clears throat> larger increase in entropy. Okay, now let's think about how temperature affects the entropy of a substance, okay? So anytime you have an increase in temperature, you're going to have a dispersal of energy, more energy, okay? So that is going to increase the entropy. So as you increase the temperature, the entropy also increases. All right, now this, um, this right here shows us how, um, is a great example of how the molecules, um, disperse more and the energy disperses more with an increase in uh, energy, okay? So if we go ahead and, okay, so here we go. So now you see uh, this is like a liquid. You see them really moving all around there. Now if I were to increase the, um, the temperature, okay, so I'm going to go up here and I'm going to increase the temperature. Okay, you just see the molecules just keep moving faster and faster and faster. So they get more and more and more and more random, okay, as the temperature. All right, now molecular complexity also affects entropy. So the more complex a molecule, the higher the entropy. So if you're going from CH4 to C2H6, C2H6 will have more entropy. And then C3H8 will have even more entropy, okay? So the more complex they get, the more entropy that they have. <clears throat> All right, and the last is Coulombic interactions, okay? So basically what we're talking about here is we're talking about 
Um, when you have an ionic solid, they arrange themselves positive, negative, positive, negative. And we're going to talk about how that affects the entropy. So let's talk about um, first what things affect the attraction between those positives and negatives. The first thing is the charge. So the higher the charge, okay, so these two pluses and two minuses have more of an attraction to one another, um, which means that they have lower entropy, okay? They should be less random because the attraction between them is so great, okay, or that much greater than the one plus and the one minus. And the other thing that affects entropy um, uh, in an ionic solid is the size of the ions. So the smaller the ions, the closer those two nuclei can get to one another, which means the stronger the um, attraction, lower the entropy. So if you have a higher charge or a smaller atom, okay, or ion, then you have lower entropy because the interaction between the positives and negatives is stronger, so it's less random. All right, and that leads us into the second law of thermodynamics, which states that any thermodynamically favored process, there's always going to be an increase in the entropy of the universe. And the entropy of the universe is constantly increasing. So everything is going towards disorder. For a given change to be thermodynamically favored, the delta S of the universe must be positive. Okay, so even if the um, substance is decreasing in entropy, the surroundings must be increasing enough so that it can overcome the system's entropy so that the delta S of the universe still remains positive, okay? So it is possible for endothermic reaction, I mean, not endothermic, for reactions that um, have a decrease in entropy to occur, but it has to um, balance out with the entropy of the surroundings, okay? All right, so first let's just give a little bit of an overview of thermodynamically favored processes versus non-favored processes, okay? couple things that you need to know. It is definitely favored if it has a delta H that is negative or delta S that's positive. So if the reaction is uh, decreasing in enthalpy or increasing in entropy, it's favored to happen, okay? That means that if you throw two things in a beaker, it's likely that they're going to react and produce some products, okay? That does not mean, however, that they will give you products very fast because remember, the rate at which it occurs is all based on kinetics, which is dependent on activation energy. Gibbs free energy is something else that we're going to talk about in a little while um, on another podcast. So just understand that at this point, if a delta, if the Gibbs free energy for a reaction is negative, then it is a favored process. All right, now that you know a little about favored processes, let's talk about non-favored processes. You should expect them to be the opposite of one another. So favorite non-favored processes are going to have a um, increase in enthalpy and a decrease in entropy. That means that if you throw two things in a beaker, they are not likely to react and make you any products. Okay, so they're not likely to do anything because it's not favorable for them to do so. But if you were to reverse that reaction, then it would be favorable. Okay, um, Gibbs free energy again needs to be positive if it is a non-favored process, okay? And again, we'll get into more of that in the uh, Gibbs Free Energy podcast.